This is chapter one. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to break it down into basically three different areas. We've got one, uh, we've got, we're going to talk a little bit about science and what science is. And then two, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about what sociology is as a science. And then three, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about theories. Uh, there's three major theoretical perspectives in sociology, and we'll discuss each one of them. So buckle in, and we'll get started. All right, so in this first section, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about what science is. Uh, and understand, first of all, that the reason why I'm, I'm starting with this is because sociology is science. A lot of people don't think about it that way, uh, but it is, it is a scientific endeavor. Uh, and that is because we don't just think about uh, what the way people are, you know, are, the way people are and about society and about social institutions and things, we actually, uh, we don't just leave it at that. What we do is we go out and we test these things. We have to find empirical evidence. And that's what science does. Science uh, is based upon the concept of positivism. And positivism means that uh, it is a way of understanding the world based upon uh, empirical evidence upon, upon observations. It's saying that if we really want to know something about the physical world, the physical universe, we have to be able to observe it. We have to be able to test it. We have to be able to falsify our uh, our, our you know thoughts about it and, and so forth. We have to be able to prove ourselves wrong. And so there are some things that are outside of the realm of science. For example, the idea of many belief systems uh, that people have. Uh, I myself am a very spiritual person. I happen to be also a religious person. That doesn't mean that I think anything less of you if you're not, because quite frankly, um, so belief systems like religious belief systems are outside of the realm of science, at least in the sense that they cannot be disproven. Uh, you cannot prove that God doesn't exist, or you cannot prove that there is no afterlife, or that there are not spirits, uh, or heaven or hell, or anything else. And because those things are not falsifiable, they're outside of the realm of science. So, uh, you know, for example, uh, if you ever watch shows like Ghost Hunters, or Ghost Adventures, or uh, Ghost Brothers, or any of these sorts of shows, uh, which I personally love. I eat them up like candy. Uh, there's the, the one of the problems is they get out their you know their EMF detector and they say uh, you know oh we've got this electromagnetic field spike and so that obviously means there's a spirit here. Well, no, not necessarily. You don't know what you're measuring. You know you're measuring electromagnetic fields, but you don't know what the source is. And it's nearly impossible to be able to tell what the source is based upon the amount of information that they have. So they use scientific instruments, and they sort of use a little bit of a scientific methodology, but they don't, they don't, they're not really doing science. It's what we call kind of quasi-science or pseudoscience. Um, maybe someday that we will discover that there are spirits and that we'll know how to measure them and things like that, and we'll be able to maybe communicate. I kind of hope so. That'd be kind of cool. However, Right now, it's outside the realm of science. So belief systems uh, are not science. Uh, and it's not that science says that those things don't exist. Science has no opinion about them. Because science cannot disprove the fact that there's a god and doesn't even try. So sometimes when you hear people talk about how there's this, this, this uh, 
kind of fight between science and religion. That's not really accurate. Uh, science is not doing any real fighting on that front. Uh, sometimes religion is. Uh, however, or at least religious people, right? Um, but uh, you have to keep in mind that, that, uh, that, that we'll talk about this later on when we talk about religion, uh, but the idea is, is that, that uh, science is silent on issues around uh, things that they cannot observe or prove or disprove. Uh, so, well, technically science doesn't actually prove anything. We just, we just gather evidence for something. And that builds and builds and builds. Um, okay, so let me explain the, the, the simplicity of this to you. Uh, here on what I'm showing you is called the Wallace's Wheel of Science. It was named after the guy, last name was Wallace, who came up with this idea. And uh, what, he, what he said was is that, uh, which is true, is that every science that you've ever studied in your life is either doing one of two things. It's either theory testing or theory building. That's it. That's all. Now, why didn't they start off with that at the beginning of your science class? I have no idea. But let me make it a little bit more complicated by saying we, either we start off with theory, meaning we have some kind of a simplified way of thinking about the world or about people or whatever it is we're studying, uh, and we build a model. Uh, it could be a model if it's in biology. It could be a model of a, a, of a uh, of, you know DNA. Uh, you've seen those before. They the, the double helix. Um, we build a model of what we think something out there in the world kind of looks like, or you know the the the, the can predict what uh, what you know why people might act the way they act or things like that. So we develop a theory. In this case, in sociology, sometimes we develop theories about uh, society. And then we, based upon those theories, we develop hypotheses. Now, a hypothesis is sometimes referred to as an educated guess. That's partly true. But what it really is is just saying, based upon this theory that we have, if we go out and measure this, if the theory is true, then we should find this. We should find X, whatever that is. And then we go out and we gather data and see if our hypotheses, therefore our theory, is actually accurate or not. And so we the, these very these very specific statements about what we expect to find can be falsified with data with evidence. Now sometimes we don't have a theory, so we start off instead just gathering data and and what we call exploratory research. Right? We go out and we just gather data. And then we try to find patterns in it. And in find, in, if we find patterns, sometimes we can make generalizations uh, from those and develop theories uh, that we can then turn around and develop hypotheses and go out and test and see if they're true. A theory that is true is going to be what we call robust, right? It's going to be a strong, powerful theory that, that stands up across time or across lots, lots of observations. Some theories, though, if theories are not uh, very not very explanatory, if they're not correct, then they're going to not explain the data very well, and they end up falling by the wayside. It's sort of science is kind of uh, survival of the fittest. I don't like using that term very often, and I'll explain later on why that might be. But the term survival of the fittest kind of fits here because the theories that are strong and robust tend to survive over time, over repeated uh, observations. Theories that are weak, uh, the weak gazelles of the herd, end up getting thinned out of the herd. Uh, so this is how science goes. It's constantly it's building theory, then testing theory, and then building theory, and then testing theory. Uh, if the theory is not quite right, maybe somebody tweaks it and, then, and changes it a little bit and says, well, I think that if we change a couple of these variables, we can better explain the data. And then you go out and you test that and you find out. Now, when you start off with general with 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 a very general like theory uh, and then you move down to observations, when you move down to from the from the general to the specific, we call that deductive reasoning. When you start off with the specific and move up to the general, we call that inductive reasoning. Now, I don't know why 
people didn't explain this to you that simply before, but it is really a quite a, quite a, a simple idea, or set of ideas. And that's all science does. I mean, everything else after that is just details. So I thought it would be a good idea to start off the semester before we really dig into what is uh, sociology and talk about theories and things like that, for you to at least have some kind of an understanding about what, what the heck we're even talking about when we talk about this. And it comes down to the concept of what is science. So now what we're going to do in this next section is we're going to talk about what is sociology. So what is sociology? Well, your book explains sociology as a systematic study of human society. Systematic because uh, sociology is a scientific discipline that focuses attention on patterns of behavior. So it's, it's science, as we just got done talking about in the last section, and our, we focus on not just an individual person's behavior, but but patterns of behavior, how people act in uh, in certain situations. So, if we were to say to study something like uh, crime, we would want to know you know why people commit crime, uh, why do they why do they commit crimes in general? And so there may be a, there are in fact there are numerous theories out there uh, that try to explain why crime happens. And some of them are biological and genetic. Some of them are psychological theories. Some of them are sociological theories. Now, so the difference here between uh, ourselves in sociology and, and my sisters and brothers in psychology, I have degrees in both, actually. So I, I, this is something that is uh, uh, something I know quite a bit about. Uh, the big difference is, is that we focus on uh, aggregate behavior. We, we focus on groups. So when the part where it says the systematic study of human society, what we mean by human society is that group behavior is our primary focus. We do in fact pay some attention to individual behavior in a sense and that's where this, there's this crossover between psychology and sociology in that there's a, there's a bridge between the two that, it, that exists in both uh, disciplines that's called social psychology. Uh, it, at DMAC, if you take a D, the DMAC course, that is a psychology course, uh, just because that's how they listed it. Uh, but it actually, I in, in my PhD program, uh, one of my concentrations is social psychology. I am a social psychologist. Uh, so we have a social psychology and sociology as well. Uh, so we're interested in how groups influence individuals and how individuals influence groups. It's a two-way street. Uh, so that's, that's also a very important idea. Now, at the heart of sociology is what we call the sociological perspective, which offers a unique view of society. It gives us a way of looking at society, kind of, for, uh, in a, kind of a bird's eye view of society, of looking at the big picture, not just focusing on individuals, uh, but actually looking at and people in groups and in communities and in you know uh, larger society and in culture, and so we focus on a lot of those types of things. Now, the the sociological perspective is a concept that came about uh, by because of the work of, of a sociologist named Peter Berger uh, in the 1960s, I believe. And Peter Berger uh, said that that the sociological perspective allows us to do two major things. One, he says, it allows us to see the general and the particular. Now, what does he mean by that? Uh, the general and the particular just simply means that, that we are able to see general patterns of behavior in individual people. So that, that uh, what we can do is recognize, first of all, that yes, we are all unique. We are all mommy and daddy's unique little snowflakes. Uh, but in fact, society has a big hand in shaping us into certain kinds of people. So your your social class, your race, your ethnicity, uh, your religious background of your family, these things all have an influence over who you become. And so we can talk about certain categories of people, uh, different types of people. And so that's what we mean by seeing the general and the particular, seeing the general social patterns in, in individual particular people. 
you know, he also said that the, the sociological perspective allows us to see what he calls the strange and the familiar. Now, this is something we're going to be doing a lot of over the semester. The strange and the familiar means that we, we get so caught up in being immersed in the game of life, of society, of living in, 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 in large numbers in, in society, that we don't really kind of even question a lot of the stuff that we do uh, or the things that we believe. Uh, for example, if you grew up in American society, you never even question whether or not capitalism is the correct way to be. I'm not saying it's not. I happen to personally like capitalism. But the point is, is that we don't even question it, right? We don't even ask that question. We just automatically assume that's just the way to be. Or democracy, right? We believe in democracy. We believe that democracy is the best way to go. Well, there are cultures around the world that, that, that simply disagree with that. They say, and eh, that's it. Democracy is you know, sloppy. It's, uh, it's slow. Uh, it's it's not a very efficient way to get things done. Is that true? Yeah, a monarchy is much more efficient. Uh, but then then again, you've got the downsides of that as well, right? So uh, by seeing the strange and the familiar, we're going to we're going to start doing this when we get to chapter two when we start talking about culture. We're going to talk about like norms and things like that, things that we don't even think about uh, that we do every single day, uh, the rules of, that we live by. Uh, or the values that we hold, or the belief systems that we hold that are based upon the culture that we live in. So the thing that we have to keep in mind is we have to give up the idea that that what we do is simply just what whatever the hell we feel like doing. Uh, you know, that, yeah, I just do it because I want to. What we have to realize is that, yes, there is free will, but it's within a framework. And that uh, society uh, shapes us into certain kinds of people, and then uh, we have to understand that that uh, many of those decisions that we think we are making are actually decisions made from a series of choices that are provided to us by society. So we don't get to choose from anything. We only get to choose from what, what we're given to choose from. So that is, it's limited free will, if you if you will. Uh, to a certain extent. I mean, I suppose it's possible to break out of that somewhat, but first you have to be aware of it. There's an old saying in sociology that we often uh, joke about, which is the idea that by the time you figured out what society's done to you, it's too late, right? Because by the time that you're old enough to start analyzing society, like you're doing in this course, and you will be doing, uh, you're already socialized, right? You've already bought into all of it. You drank the Kool-Aid. So, you know, it's, uh, it, it's somewhat difficult, but, but we will start looking at uh, the kind of the mechanisms of society and start kind of unraveling some of this stuff that seems so familiar to us. And when you start looking at it, it starts becoming kind of strange. Now, the next thing that I wanted to talk about is this idea of uh, you know, kind of applying some of this concept of looking at Durkheim's study of suicide. Uh, and this is kind of looking at that idea of the, the strange and the familiar, is that we, when we think about suicide, if I were to ask you, if you were a bunch of psychologists, say you're all, I've done you all psychologists, <coughs> excuse me, and I say, why do people commit suicide? Odds are, what you're going to t answer is something like, well, because they're, they have, they're, they're depressed, right, major depression, major depressive disorder, or because of some horrible event that occurred in their lives, or because, you know, and, and so on and so forth. But what you're going to do is you're going to give me a lot of individual answers, like that are, because we think of suicide as being a very individualistic kind of thing. Uh, but actually, what Emil Durkheim, Durkheim, by the way, uh, was a French sociologist, and he, went, he was one of the first uh, sociologists, and in fact, he actually uh, created uh, sociology as a university discipline. So he was the first, he wasn't the first person to coin the phrase sociology, uh, but he was one of the first sociologists. That was uh, Auguste Comte, German uh, philosopher, who came up with the, 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 the term sociology. But uh, Durkheim actually, you could actually go and take sociology classes in college. 
And so that and that was in the 1800s. So that was the first time that you could do that. Now, uh, so he's often referred to as the father of sociology, also because he did some of the first real scientific uh, types of studies of not just individuals, but of groups, uh, where the individual was not the focus, the, the, the group was the focus. And so Durkheim, uh, what he did was he said, well, what if some certain types of people are more likely or less likely to commit suicide than other types of people. Not individuals, just certain categories of people. What if, you know, because we think of, right, we think of free will. We think of, the well, I, I you know, people choose to commit suicide or they choose not to commit suicide. And it's all about the individual choice. But what if it's not? That's what Durkheim was saying. What if it's not? What if just being in a certain type of category makes you more likely to go down that road? So it's not purely free will, right? It's it's sort of structured free will. It's contained free will. And so Durkheim, uh, actually what he did was he had no theory to start off with. Remember we talked about this in the last section. He had no theory to, to start off with. So what he did was he went out and gathered data, data about uh, suicides. And it didn't have, it was, he wasn't interested in the individuals who committed suicide. He was interested in the event. Somebody committed suicide, what what are their cat what different categories do, are they in? What types of people are they? And then he started looking for patterns. And he found some. And what he said what he said was is that he found that that uh, people that were more likely to commit suicide were, were male Protestants who were wealthy and unmarried, and people who were less likely to commit suicide were male Jews and Catholics who were poor and married. Now again, the strange and the familiar. That seems very strange, because we, we you know, it's it's not exactly intuitive. When he said that, uh, you know, when he, when he talks about like a male Protestants who are wealthy and, and unmarried, he's talking about variables, right? That in the in the la, ba, the back part of your chapter of chapter one, the last part talks about uh, research methodology and variables as a part of that. Uh, and each one of the, these concepts is a variable that, you know, that, that varies from case to case. One like wealth, uh, how much wealth does a person have? Not everybody has the same amount of wealth. Some people have more, some people have less, some professors have way less. And so you have uh, this idea of, uh, of a variable. And each one of these are variables. Now, he, they're, they're, your author is kind of combining these things uh, into, a, into a kind of a, a person. But uh, what what we're saying here is that you know why, for example, males. Well, males are uh, more likely to commit suicide. Uh, we find out much later uh, because of the fact that males commit suicide more often, and they tend to use methods that are kind of final, you know, like guns, uh, hanging, things like that 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 are brutal, uh, and yet. Women actually, actually, and we found this out much later. Women actually attempt suicide more than men, but succeed less because they tend to use less lethal methods, uh, like taking a lot of pills or something, where there's time in between. Somebody can find you and maybe save you and and that sort of thing. Um, so, male Protestants. So Protestant. Uh, why Protestants versus uh, Jews or Catholics? Well. Protestantism is uh, is a little bit less structured in the same way that, that Judaism and Catholicism are, which are very ritualized, very structured uh, types of religious groups that are religious denominations that put a great deal of emphasis on really having a lot of social cohesion in the group. Protestantism is a little bit more laid back and doesn't have quite the same amount of kind of social glue that holds everybody together. Um, also, wealth versus poverty. You think, that seems strange, right? Why would wealthy people commit suicide more than or at higher rates than people who are poor? Poor people have a hell of a lot more reason to commit suicide many times. Uh, but the fact is, is that it, it comes down to think of it like a pyramid. You know, when you as you move up the social ladder, there's fewer and fewer people up at the top that are like you. Uh, so you have less fewer people to uh, connect with. 
And so you are more and more socially isolated. Uh, if you're poor, you look around you, everybody's poor, right? I mean, there's, you're, you're, you're not anything unique and everybody can understand each other's circumstances. Uh, and people tend to be around other people that are kind of the same socioeconomic status that they are. So poor people tend to live around poor people and interact with poor people and marry poor people and so forth. And middle class are the same way and the wealthy the same way. So uh, being wealthy in a sense, even though it may provide you with a lot more material gain, uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, make you less likely to commit suicide. In fact, it makes you more likely to commit suicide because you're more socially isolated. Uh, and then married versus unmarried. It's kind of, that's kind of a no-brainer once we realize, once we start kind of picking this apart and looking at what we're really looking at, which is kind of connected, connectedness, this idea of how connected are you to society, to other people, to groups. And that's what Durkheim found. He developed a theory. He started off with observations, found some some empirical generalizations, generalized, and then and then developed a theory that he called uh, social integration theory. And social integration theory is a theory that says that the more connected you are, the more social glue there is uh, between you and other people, you and other groups, you and society. The, the more and stronger social ties you have to, to everyone around you, the less likely you are to commit suicide. Now, flip that on its head. The less social ties you have, we could call that social isolation, right? That you're more and more socially isolated. And if you think about it, what is one of the first thing, if, you, if, you take, if you've taken psychology, you know, one of the first things that people do when they uh, become suicidal is they isolate themselves, which makes the situation even worse. So they, they cut off all their social ties to everyone. They, they become socially isolated, and that, that just increases the likelihood of them committing suicide. Uh, so this is a really good example of sociological uh, research in that it is a good example of inductive reasoning, right? Starting off with the specific and then moving to the general by developing a theory. By the way, this theory is in fact robust, extremely robust, because we found out that, you know, a hundred and something years later, we realized that Durkheim's uh, social integration is true. It's still true. If you went out and studied people now, if you went and gathered a bunch of suicide data, and you had a bunch of variables that you that you, of of their their social variables, uh, and you applied the same theory, you would find the same thing that he found. And it seems to be even cross cultural. No matter what culture you go to, the people that are more socially isolated. In other words, we seem to need each other, not just to get things done, but we seem to need each other just even to survive emotionally. Uh, which is very interesting if you think about it, right? That, that, that the more connected you are, uh, the less likely you are to kind of stray from the herd and end up by yourself uh, socially and then end up committing suicide. So it has a lot of real, real life implications. So if you, were a, if you wanted to be a therapist, say, and you knew about this study, which most psychologists, by the way, don't know about, uh, think about how much better uh, you would be at being a therapist by saying, you know, I think that uh, one of the things that, you know, for my if, my, if I have a patient that says, you know, that they're suicidal, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to start trying to figure out ways to get them connected, to, to kind of make them force themselves to stay connected. You know, whether that's church or getting involved in something, uh, some kind of group activity or maintaining strong social ties with, with their, uh, what we call, what psychologists like to call support systems, right? Well, what is a support system? A support system is strong social ties. Think about, uh, you know, people who, you know, and it's not just suicide, by the way. Social isolation applies in a lot of things. People who uh, are more likely to uh, drop out of school, social isolation versus social integration. The more integrated you are, the less likely you are to drop out. The more socially isolated you are, the more likely you are. 
uh, even with all the other variables. Uh, or, or how about if you're trying to recover from drug addiction or alcohol addiction? Uh, what, do, what do they do? What do they say that you should do? Well, right, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, right, um, all these different types of groups, you get involved, you stay involved, you connect, you, you network with people because you are then held accountable for your behavior. You can't just drop off the grid because if you, if you, if you start doing that, if you start isolating yourself, guess what? You're going to start using again because you have no one to answer to. Well, think about how many people that you have to answer to in your life, right? Do you have kids? Do you have a, a significant other? Do you have parents, siblings, friends, right? A church uh, congregation. I mean, there, there may be a number of different groups that that uh, that you don't want to let down. And so there's some of it that's psychology, right? But some of it is sociology, that we can apply sociological concepts. And when you bring the two together, you can actually do a better job of understanding human behavior than both things uh, apart. Okay, so in the next section of what we're going to do is talk about uh, the three major theoretical perspectives. In order to understand the three major theoretical perspectives, which we'll deal with in this uh, section, uh, the first thing we need to do is to figure out what is theory. Now, theory is just a statement of how and why facts are related to one another. Uh, this is just a, a way of trying to understand a simplified version of the world uh, or of human behavior. Say, for example, we talked about the idea of deviance, of, uh, of crime, like why crime happens. What we do is we develop theories that are designed to uh, try to explain uh, how these different facts, these different variables are related to one another. So, for example, we might, we might look at poverty, we might look at population density, we might look at how many other people around you are also criminals. That might be a variable that, that, uh, that might influence you through social learning. So we look at all these variables and, we ha and, we, we, and then we say, how do those relate to whether or not an, any one individual person uh, ends up going down the road uh, to committing crimes? So that's all theory is. Theory, theory explains social behavior in the real world. It, 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 it's a way of, of uh, creating models so that we can kind of help to understand the way society is structured and things like that. So in that, there are what we call theoretical paradigms. A paradigm is just a large category is all it means. So we have these three large categories when we actually talk about uh, social theories, we're talking about much more specific things. Now, for all intents and purposes, for our, for us in intro to sociology, the difference between a paradigm and a theory is kind of kind of irrelevant for us. Uh, but understand that just we have these kind of three major approaches to understanding uh, society. Now. Understand just for your own knowledge that within each one of these these approaches, in, inside of each one of these paradigms, there's a whole lot of different uh, sub theories, which are actual theories. The, the rest of these are kind of macro theories, kind of big. Uh, well, macro in the sense of uh, of that they're they're kind of these like an umbrella sort of category. Um, that, that a whole bunch of smaller theories fit into. So there's this big category and then smaller categories. It's sort of like, say for example, in your, uh, on your uh, computer, you have uh, uh, folders, and inside those folders you have a bunch of files. Uh, the folder would be like a, a theoretical paradigm, and then the theories, the individual theories, would be part of that, inside of that folder. Does that make sense? I don't know. It made sense in my head for some reason. I think in terms of, uh, in terms of computers and technology and things like that. Uh, so yeah. Uh, okay. So the three major theoretical approaches that we use. 
are what we call structural functionalism, and we'll talk about each one of these in turn, social conflict theory, and symbolic interaction theory. Now, uh, what when we talk about the first two of these theories, structural functionalism and social conflict theory, these are what we call macro theories. Macro meaning they're, they're large. They're looking at society as a whole, uh, studying society like it's a thing, like it's an organism to be studied. Uh, symbolic interaction, though, is what we call uh, a, a micro theory, a theory that um, that really focuses on, uh, rather than looking at kind of the big picture like society as a whole, a bird's eye view of society like the other two theories, uh, symbolic interactionism really focuses on individuals and small groups. So it's uh, it's much more specific and, and kind of in, individual. Uh, it's closer to psychology than, than uh, the other two theories are. Okay, so let's start off by talking about uh, structural functionalism. Our first of the three theories, uh, one of the macro theories that looking at society as a whole, is called structural functionalism. Now, the thing about structural functionalism is that in the the the, the name itself, it actually kind of gives away part about what what it is. And what it's saying is is that is it's making the argument that society is made up of structures. So. It is uh, looking at uh, big macro structures in society like institutions. You've heard of some of these, the institution of the family, the institution of religion, uh, health care, uh, uh, the criminal justice system, excuse me, the criminal justice system, the uh, uh, education, uh, politics, you know, things like that. So um, there are uh, numerous of these social institutions that exist out there. Uh, and what we do is these kind of these big structures in society, they perform functions for society. So society is made up of these structures that perform very specific functions to make sure that society continues to run smoothly. Now, this is a macro level orientation. So looking at society kind of from a bird's eye view, looking at society as a whole, it's concerned with broad patterns that shape society as a whole. So looking at these kind of as a, as from a, a big picture standpoint. Um, this theory views society as a complex system whose parts work together for, to promote solidarity and stability. Okay, so there's functions in there if you think about it, right? So it says what, you know, it kind of says what does it do? It functions to promote solidarity and stability in society. Solidarity meaning the glue that holds society together, the social glue, and stability meaning that the equilibrium and balance of society. To those two things together continue to allow society to run smoothly. Uh, so here's, an, here's a metaphor for you. You can think of society uh, much like, say, for example, like the human body. The human body is made up of, a, it's a system and it's made up of a lot of different structures. You've got the brain, the heart, uh, the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, the pancreas, the skin, circulatory system, the uh, uh, digestive system, right? And all of these different parts, all these different structures perform very specific functions for society. The pancreas, you know, creates insulin to count to, to bring down uh, blood sugar levels and pro help the liver process that. Uh, so these things are very important. Now all of these things are interconnected, right? All of the different structures in the body are interconnected. They don't they don't exist all on their own. If one if one of them start starts functioning improperly, then it affects the entire system, not just that one uh, structure. Well, structural functionalists say society uh, works the same way that society is made up of all these different structures and that these different structures are interconnected and that they depend upon one another and that changes in one of them affect all of the all of the rest of them so if you think about something like uh, the institution of the economy for example 
if if the economy starts to tank, that doesn't just affect the institution of the economy, does it? It affects uh, the family. It affects religion because now now uh, churches can't. Uh, you know, they, they bring their coffers and they're nearly empty now because nobody has money to donate. And so on and on, right? They, they, these, all of these different uh, structures are interconnected. So uh, the idea, there's two, two ideas here. There's social structure and social function. And both of them are together vital for this, uh, for this theory. This theory says that that's how society works. So this theory is not focused on you and me as individuals. We're just cogs in the machine. We are just the tiny little worker ants that are running around. They're looking at the big picture stuff. They're looking at institutions like the government, or they're looking at the economy. They're looking at you know corporations. They're looking at uh, you know uh, the the healthcare industry, right? They're looking at all kinds of things like that. They're not focused on on the on the the, the day to day details of of your and my life, whether you get laid off or whether I get a job or vice versa, right? They're not concerned about those types of things. They're concerned about the big picture. So that is structural functionalism, that society is made up of social structures, these big macro structures, and they all perform functions, and society is all interrelated. All of these big institutions are interrelated and depend upon each other in order to maintain solidarity and stability so that society can run like a well-oiled machine. Otherwise, it starts to get kind of clunky. You know, imagine, you know, you're the engine in your car. If parts of it start working, don't do their job, then the whole thing starts running kind of, kind of bad. So that's structural functionalism uh, in a nutshell. Uh, it's actually a fairly simple theory. It's not all that difficult, uh, and but it has implications for how we how the the structure functions see individuals and and so on. So we'll talk more about these later on as we go through the semester. But I just wanted to introduce it to you. So that's structural functions. Our second of the three theories, the other macro theory, right, looking at society as a whole, big picture kind of theory, is called social conflict theory, or social the social conflict paradigm. And uh, there's a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of individual theories with, that fit within this kind of umbrella term of the social conflict paradigm. But conflict theory is a theory that looks at uh, instead of uh, the structural functionalists, the structural functionalists tend to look at society in terms of how it functions, right? How it works. And so from a structural functionalist standpoint, they're focusing on what makes society functional, right? right? What, what, when, when it works, why does it work? The problem is, is that it doesn't do a very good job in many cases of explaining things like inequality, social conflict, uh, looking at uh, the haves and the have-nots, right? All of these things that uh, uh, that that don't make society run all that smoothly. Uh, and so, uh, what this theory does is it tries to provide a uh, an alternative view of society. Now, this theory actually comes out of the work originally of Karl Marx, the German philosopher who got kicked out of Germany. Uh, for being too radical, and then uh, eventually ended up uh, living his in his elder years in uh, London, uh, and, uh, and and lived very very poor. Um, and his view of uh, uh, you know he was looking at the you know what was happening in the Industrial Revolution, and looking at kind of the early days of this real cutthroat capitalism that that we had. And he was looking at kind of this inequality. He said, he said, you know, these people that are doing all this work in factories and things like that, you know, backbreaking work, um, are getting almost none of the value back on their own labor. That they're they're working really hard, but they're making almost nothing. 
while the people who own the means of production, who own the factories, who own the companies, they're the ones raking it all in, all the profits. Uh, and this was very different than, than, uh, than before the Industrial Revolution when you had cottage industry where people kind of worked for themselves. So you might be a cobbler, right? You make shoes. Uh, you make shoes and you sell shoes and you get 100% of the profit. You provide the labor, you sell it, you get the money. And that's why, we, you know, it's when we think about entrepreneurs today, right? That an entrepreneur is somebody that, uh, that, that tries to create their own business so that they can, uh, uh, you know, create, especially a, a, a craftsperson is someone who is going to uh, provide something. They're going to make something and then they're going to sell it and then they get 100% of the profit. Um, but, or at least it goes into their business, you know, the business they create. But if you happen to be somebody who's working for someone else, in other words, if you're somebody who has to sell your labor for wages, then uh, for, for that's being hired by someone else, then what you end up, uh, what he called uh, the industrial proletariat, he thought that that system was inherently very unfair. It was it was wonderful for the for the bourgeoisie, the capitalist class, the people who owned everything, the super rich. Uh, but it wasn't very good for the average worker. In fact, it was it, it, during Marx's time it was pretty awful for the average worker. Now, out of his uh, his initial uh, criticisms of capitalism and of uh, the industrial revolution and and that sort of thing, came an entire uh, paradigm. That uh, in sociology that focuses on things like inequality. So it looks at they view society as an arena of inequality that generates conflict and, and social change. So that's what their their argument is: is that society is structured in ways that benefit a, a few of the a few of the people at the top at the expense of the majority. Not uh, that that everybody's winning, right? It's that a small number of people at the top win at the expense of everyone else, meaning that that uh, the people who have the most power in society are really exploiting everyone else they can in order to be able to amass ungodly amounts of wealth. Uh, and it probably is real hard for you to relate to some of this, especially, you know, since... Uh, uh, you know, since the stock market crash and you know, and and, and, uh, and our economy crashed uh, in early, you know, in late two thousand eight, early two thousand nine, uh, it's probably not real hard for you to 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 look at this and go, yeah, you know, because now we're really talking about social problems like the haves and the have-nots. We're talking about uh, why is it that that the the super rich just keep getting richer and richer and the poor keep getting poorer, and the middle class share of of uh, of income hasn't gone up since the, since the late 70s, uh, that has kind of stayed flat across time. Uh, and the answer is, is that according to this theory, the answer is, is because uh, that's how the most powerful people want it. They, they can get more rich the more they pay you less. And so this uh, view is, uh, they, they, but they don't just focus on just that type of inequality, just economic inequality. That's one of them. But they look at race. They look at sex, social class, age, uh, disability. There's all kinds of different things that they're focused on. And they look at uh, how those things generate inequality between people that are in power and people that don't have power who are trying, often trying to gain power, trying to gain equality. Um, so this is kind of a dominant ver group versus subordinate group or minority group relations. Uh, I teach a, a course called Minority Group Relations, and we spend the entire semester talking about, you know, the people who have power, the dominant group, uh, and then people that, that have less power who are trying to gain power. Uh, a good example of that that's, that's happened in the last uh, few years is uh, maybe the last 10 or 15 years is... Uh, uh, you know, just look at sexual orientation and how people that had that that had to hide in the closet and have, uh, you know, be and, and were afraid for anybody to even know they were uh, L LGBT uh, in just a short period of time have have now have the right to marry. Uh, we're we're having all these social battles over this because they're saying. Look, all we want is equality. All we want is to have the same kinds of considerations that everyone else has. Now, 
regardless of how you feel about any of that, that is really what it is. And it comes down to pe people saying, we just want equality. And uh, so you have incompatible interests. You have the people that, that have the power. And if those, if those interests don't match the power of the, uh, the interests of the supporting group, and they almost never do, then you end up with a situation where there's conflict. And that conflict can play out in any number of ways. Often, it, it, you know, you have social movements, protests. You may have um, all kinds of, of you know, even, uh, there may be legal uh, arguments to be made, you know, legal challenges to, to laws and things like that. <clears throat> and so you end up in, the, in, in that type of a situation. So social conflict theory is focusing on kind of what's wrong with society, looking at the, 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 the difference between the people who have power and people who don't have power, and looking at uh, kind of inherently what's wrong with society, what's wrong with that, with that picture. So that is social conflict. Paradigm. So modern day social conflict theorists, uh, or as I refer to them, I just call them conflict theorists. Modern day conflict theorists are going to focus on things like they like there there are feminist theorists. There are what's called uh, queer theory, which is uh, that's actually the name of it. I'm not uh, that 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 used to be a pejorative term, but it's now being used uh, kind of taken back, if you will by uh, sociologists who study this stuff within the, the LGBT community. And, uh, and so queer theory is theory about theories about sexual orientation and gender and things like that. So, uh, but these are, you know, these are sociologists who study this stuff and they're interested in it. So that is the second of our th three major theoretical perspectives. The next one, our final one, is going to be looking at symbolic interaction. Carry on my wayward son, there'll be peace when you are done. Lay your weary head to rest, don't you cry no more. The last of these three theories uh, is our micro theory. Our micro theory is called symbolic interaction, or symbolic interactionism, and symbol the symbolic interaction paradigm is one that is a little bit more complicated to explain. This is the one that uh, the other two are kind of easy to understand. This is the one that, if you uh, listen to what I have to say about it, and you kind of walk away with a sense of, I guess I sort of get that. That's good enough <laughs> for, for now. That's that's fine. Because uh, it is a complicated theory because it has its roots in philosophy. So I'm going to have to explain, give you a little bit of backstory if I want you to understand this theory very well. Okay, so symbolic interactionism is a, a theory that comes out of the work of George Herbert Mead. And George Herbert Mead uh, was a, uh, a very interesting guy. Uh, who never wrote a book himself, uh, never did very, did very little publishing. Uh, he, he was a professor, and he, uh, would, he came up with this, this idea, and he went and he would teach it. He had these old yellowed note, handwritten notes that he would, uh, and he would just go up, and, and like in the old days, uh, he would just go up, and this was in the, you know, the 20s and 30s, he would go up and read his notes to his students. Uh, we try to be a little bit more entertaining than that now, don't we? Uh, <laughs> so, but but when he passed away, his uh, students, his ex students, his grad students, got together and got, gathered up all of his uh, his his theory and published it in a in a book uh, that was called George Herbert Mead: Mind, Self, and Society. And so uh, where does this theory come from? First of all, it's a micro-level orientation that's focusing on up-close uh, focuses on, on in, in social interactions in specific situations. So instead of looking at kind of the big picture, looking at society as a whole, we're looking at individuals and small groups in very specific situations uh, and then analyzing them, studying them. 
and trying to understand, instead of trying to understand kind of this big picture and the, how these different social structures work together, they're focusing on looking at how individuals and small groups interact with one another and how they develop even a, a sense of, uh, of reality. Uh, now that's where it starts to get a little bit complicated because what this is, the, this views society as simply the product of everyday situations, everyday interactions between people, between you and I. And so, uh, meaning that the society is really nothing more than that. Uh, both structural functionalism and social conflict theory are kind of top-down theories, right? They're theories that look at uh, how we as individuals are controlled by society. You know, that, that structural functionalism says that we're just sort of like worker ants, you know, we're just, you know, not really important at all uh, by ourselves. And conflict theory looks at it like, you know, that the most powerful people in society kind of run everything and the rest of us are just their, the pawns on their chessboard. So symbolic interaction, however, has a little bit of a different view of it. It looks at, at, at the individuals uh, and, and looks at the concept of agency. Agency means that you and I get to choose. We have free will and we choose our own path. Uh, so this is a little bit different. Now, where this comes from is out of philosophy. Now, let me uh, read this statement to you here that you can see on here so the, then I can talk about it. Society is nothing more than the shared reality that people construct as they interact with one another. Now, think about that. All that's saying is, is that uh, we have, you and I, in society, we construct a reality. It's not there, apparently, it's that we create it. Now, that seems a little strange, but understand where this comes from. This comes from the work of, of René Descartes, a, a French philosopher, who uh, was kind of concerned about the idea that uh, it's ba basic principles. Okay, so he said, first of all, he said, I can know nothing about the world except that which I know through my senses. So think about that for a moment. You don't everything you know about the physical world around you the objective world and your even your own body everything you know you only know through your your senses you know your smell your taste your touch right your sight your hearing that's the only way you know anything about this world right that's all you know so what happens if um our senses are fooled our senses can be fooled, right? I mean, we we we've seen uh, you know if you if you and sometimes in psychology textbooks they'll show you uh, uh, optical illusions and things like that. The the uh, the the old woman that turns into a young woman, an old woman and young woman. Your your brain flips back and forth. You might have seen something like that. <laughs> and so, excuse me. And so. If, if, our, if, if everything we know about the physical world is the objective world is only known through our senses and our senses can be fooled, then how do we know anything exists? How do we know this isn't us being duped? We're being tricked. This is the matrix, right? The whole concept of the matrix comes out of Descartes' work. Uh, this idea of the what we what, he, what some some others have called the simulacra or the simulated world. How do we know this isn't this isn't a, some kind of elaborate computer simulation or some form of trickery by uh, some powerful being? How do we know that uh, that that this isn't just a dream? Uh, well, we don't. Honestly, we can't know that. Uh, what? But but then, or what are we left with? Are we left with then? I don't exist. You don't exist. Well, no, actually, because you can't really know that I exist, but you can know that you exist. Why? Because you're concerned about existing. <laughs> you just you're you're thinking about all these things that I that I just that I'm talking about right now, and in that you might be being tricked. None of this might be real. And there might be someone out there tricking you, fooling you, duping you. But quite frankly, in order for you to be duped, 
that means you exist. And now, this has been expressed in Latin, and it's cogito ergo sum. It means, I think, therefore I am. You might have heard of that before. That's what this means. I think, therefore I am. I exist. That's the only thing that you can truly know, is that you exist. You can't know that any of the rest of this is real. You don't even know that this video I'm making you or I exist. All you know is you exist. Now, given that, uh, what do we know about reality then? Well, for example, if, if you and I look at, um, you know, something in, you know, out, out here in the world and uh, let's see, um, let me grab this, this flashlight. Now, I tell you this is a flashlight. And you look at it and you go, yep, that's a flashlight. Okay? So we, we agree on what this object is. Now, if I look at this and I say, this is a green flashlight. And you look at it and you go, yep, that's green. Now, do I know that your perception of green is the same as my perception of green? No. I have no idea. I mean, what you perceive as green might be something else, but all we know is, the only thing we know is, is that whatever this is, we agree we're going to call it green. That's it. So, reality is agreement. We negotiate reality. I look at it and I say green, you look at it and you go, yep, that's green. That's all we really know, because that is reality. Reality is not objective, and if it is, we don't know anything about it. All we know is that we agree on what's real. That's all. I know, that's kind of messed up, isn't it? So, that means reality is just a negotiation. Reality is just agreement. We agree what's real. And that's all. So let's apply this back to this, this again. It says that society is nothing more than the shared reality that people construct as they interact with one another. So when you and I interact, we, agree, we come to an agreement on the situation. You agree that I am a professor, and that, you know, I have, you know, certain things about me. I agree that you're a student. And so what we do together is we construct a reality. We construct it. Uh, and, and we'll talk more about what goes into that construction later on. So we'll get, you know, we'll get into the, the weeds on this. But right now, all you have to understand is, is that society is nothing more than the shared reality of a whole bunch of people interacting with each other every day. And each one of us, whenever we interact, we construct a reality. And that reality can change in the middle too, right? I mean, um, have you ever uh, talk, been talking, so you saw somebody at the store and you couldn't figure out, you couldn't place who they were? And you knew you knew them from somewhere, but you start talking to them, and of course you're playing it off because you don't want to, you know, you don't want to, you know, seem like you don't know who they are because they act like they really know you. So you're like, oh, while well, you're talking to them, you're just desperately trying to figure it, figure it out, and then all of a sudden it comes to you, and then the dynamic of of the of that interaction changes, the the reality changes. Uh, so reality is a, a a constructed thing. So you'll hear me over the course uh, over the semester talk about the social construction of reality, and I'll say it over and over and over. The reality is socially constructed, not individually constructed, socially constructed through agreement. Does that make any sense? A little, maybe. <laughs> I know it's complicated, and it, believe me, it even gets more complicated than that. Uh, but I think it's, this is really cool stuff because I'm a nerd. Um, so what is society then? Society is a, is a complex, ever-changing mosaic, right? Like a, 
a, a stained glass window, a, a quilt of you know of, of different colors and things like that, of subjective meanings. Subjective meanings, meaning that it's not objective; it's created, it's constructed. It's very cool. This is a this is a very interesting theory, and uh, when we you'll find out later on in in a, a later chapter, I will use this particular theory and some of the sub theories to teach you how to manipulate the crap out of people. It's a very powerful thing. Um, and I'm going to make you so much freaking money, you have no idea. It's just that uh, I've got to teach you some of the, the techniques and things like that of how to control other people's impressions of you, like how, control how they see you. Okay, so that is uh, the end of symbolic interaction. And it is the end of this uh, particular uh, uh, chapter. And hopefully some of this made sense to you. Uh, it, it's, uh, some of it's kind of complicated, but most of it is, is fairly simple when it's explained properly. I hope, hopefully I explained it properly to you. So um, hopefully this will help you out when you read the chapter. And, uh, may, and, and that way the chapter when you read it will make a little bit more sense. All right. Thank you very much.